Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guest. I welcome you to part two of a two-week series titled Celebrating Successful Women in Government and Education. Last week we had three wonderful guests and we have three different guests and we're very proud to have them with us. And they're all very distinguished in their field. I first of all, welcome to the program, Hazel Bowman. Uh, she just recently became superintendent of the Coeur d'Alene School District. And congratulations. Thank you. I know you've been with the district uh, quite a while, and uh, you do wonderful work, and good luck in this new endeavor. Thanks so much. And I'm equally pleased to have Dr. Dean Thomas, who is the president of Lewis Clark State College, and I believe you've been president for about six years or eight? Seven, actually. Seven. And let me tell you, it's my pleasure to be here. Well, it's a pleasure to have you, and I, under your leadership, I there's been a real very significant growth in the student enrollment and 34 percent in yeah, seven years that's very very commendable and welcome to the program thank you and I'm e equally very pleased to welcome our mayor of Coeur d'Alene the, the Honorable Sandy Bloom and Sandy and I've been friends for many years and you're in your second term and I, am. I believe you're only the second mayor that's had been elected twice oh, you're right in, in over a hundred years See, I remember that and so <laughs> congratulations to you and we're very delighted that you are our mayor and I welcome to the program to assist me in questioning our distinguished guest, uh, Dr. Bob Bennett, who uh, is the former president of North Idaho College, and he also served as president of some other colleges. And he now, fortunately, is the executive director of the Human Rights Education Center in, uh, and Institute in Coeur d'Alene. Bob, you have the first question. Oh, that's great. I, I too, want to thank you for coming and being part of this panel. I, uh, I'm excited about the potential comments that will be coming forth. First question. I know that there aren't as many women in all of these different positions as men, but in my lifetime there are certainly more now than there were just a few years ago. My question is, why do you think so many women are being selected to important leadership positions? Whomever would like to go first. Let's let Dr. Thomas go first. Oh, Bob, that's a great question. And uh, I would like to say, first of all, I think it's because there are so many more enlightened men. Ah, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> <laughs> like you and Tony, who have been working with us to promote uh, the good uh, leadership of both men and women. Uh, but to go beyond all of the enlightened men who are our partners in it, I would also say that the first of anything is the slowest and the toughest. And as you get a greater critical mass, as you get more, the tipping point, mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell, mm -hmm. that uh, it gets easier. The first one's tough, the second one is not quite so bad, and maybe the 323rd is relatively easy. And we're making great strides in so many areas of management and leadership. Couldn't agree with you more. Hazel Bowman. Well, I would just add that, um, to, to add to, uh, to what Dean said, that we have reached a critical mass now in awareness at least, maybe not in numbers, um, still particularly in superintendent's role that I'm um, now engaged in. Um, men definitely outnumber women, especially in Idaho, but in the awareness that women are equally capable and um, should be selected when, when they are available, um, I believe we have reached that tipping point and very, very few people would say that on the basis of gender a decision should be made as to whether to hire a candidate or not. So uh, th the awareness piece is huge. Thank you. Mayor Bloom. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that <coughs> men and women have realized that uh, leadership is better when we are partnering and we bring both genders to the table. And, and in doing that, we have also said to men, I think, we raise better f children and we have better families because we're asking men to share with us at home so that we can go out into the workforce as much as we have. So to me, it, it is one of those issues where we've brought the awareness of men and women working together both at home and in, in uh, the areas that we represent. Okay. Before I ask my question, I'll just have a footnote to what you said. I really appreciate those comments. I just love what you said, Dean Thomas, about <laughs> partnership. It's really, really important. Uh, just on the national political scene, 
uh, it was almost impossible for a Catholic to win the presidency until John Kennedy mm -hmm. won, the, and it's not an issue anymore. In this campaign, not showing any partisanship, but the fact is that the uh, two final candidates, and, and that will be over by the time this airs, but uh, one a woman and one an African American, following that, and no matter who wins the election in November, uh, including the Republican candidate, that barrier will be down. It's those kind of things that make the change. But my question, is, as I asked the other guests last week, and I'll start with Mayor Bloom so we rotate this, I think both men and women that are real successful in life uh, almost always have someone in their background, one or more that have been mentors to them and inspired them. And I'd like for you to share that with us. Well, first of all, I want to share with you that it's very difficult for me to pick one or two mentors. Yes. I, I really, uh, even today at my age, look at everyone I meet and ask myself, is there something within that person that I would like to have within me? And that's how I feel I've grown to where I am. But I was very fortunate because I had two grandmothers who both uh, went to college, who both worked in a business and shared a business with their husbands. Uh, who both held a very soft side and yet set boundaries and raised wonderful families. And so clear back in that generation, that was pretty unusual, and I saw that happening. So they, they were two strong mentors for me, but I'd have to name many, many more sure. if I... That's, that's also fascinating. I've asked this question many times, and really quite often there's something within the family structure or some people uh, even going back the, maybe more than one generation that's really impacted and inspired. So the family is very important in that process. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Thomas? Well, I would have to say family as well. My Danish grandmother, my mother, who when I brought a report card home with an A- minus on it, said, why the minus? <laughs> and I knew she loved me. Yes. I also knew that she had very high expectations, and I would be much more comfortable in the house if I lived up to those expectations. And so I worked hard to do so. All the way through college, a lot of mentors. Uh, when I went to the Bryn Mawr Summer Institute for Women in Higher Education Administration, very long title, we were all women, 75 of us, with women leaders. And what a time to relax and exult in the presence mm -hmm. of women and in confidence building. And that was a watershed experience for me. These are wonderful answers. And Hazel Bowman? Well, I'd have to say my father. Um, so not a female mentor particularly, although many along the way I would concur with Mayor Bloom that just too many to mention, male and female. But my father had very high expectations for me. I was the firstborn in our family, and my um, brothers didn't come along for about a decade. So um, I had a lot of uh, father-daughter um, opportunities, great dialogues into the night about important factors. There was no doubt I was going to go to college, no doubt that I was going to um, try and make a difference because he, he had a really strong social justice piece of him and he really imbued that in me that get out there and make a difference. So I guess I'd make a plea for fathers and daughters to make those connections. It's, it's very, very powerful. That's really interesting. Uh, thoughts that come out of these discussions, and I m remember interviewing a professor from Whitworth University, and one of her studies is the, the family siblings in the order of birth and all, and uh, she indicated that the, the firstborn a lot of times have certain characteristics, so also might have been fortunate to be the firstborn <laughs> and, and have that distance. Maybe. Yeah. Bob Bennett? There's a lot of study coming out now about firstborn and the impact that uh, parents had on them because they get more attention than those who came later. I don't know how true that is, but I want to go back to the, uh, the father-daughter thing. That I think that's an extremely important concept and needs to be explored a great deal more. Um, my question is, I'll have to preface it by saying I just finished this book by Dee Dee Meyer saying women should rule the world. One of the points she makes, and she has some pretty good information to back her up that because of social differences and how we grew up and so forth, women have learned to resolve differences differently than men. I'd like to know your thoughts about that. Hazel, you'd like to start this time? First? Okay. Well, I do think there are differences, and I think, you know, I'm from Canada, so viva la difference, right? <laughs> and, and, um, and I think that we should celebrate those differences, mm -hmm. not, not uh, try and denigrate them or hide them. Uh -oh. And <coughs> I think one of the differences, 
generally speaking, and of course with all generalizations there are exceptions Absolutely. and we know that, but generally speaking I think um, women are looking to, to nurture and support and to protect, it, it just sort of comes with the territory and, and that those, those attributes that are probably engineered into us for procreation and, and survival of the species we also bring into the workplace and so that there is a genuine desire to build consensus to nurture along ideas and people and to um, to do things in, in, in not always but in often times in a, in a kind of a kinder and gentler fashion and I think having the mix of that nurturing with perhaps the more direct approach, the more um, assertive approach that men bring to the table can make a very powerful organization. Very good comments. Uh, I want to refer to some research here by a woman who's of this area. And uh, uh, Priscilla Bell mentioned her last week, and that's Carolyn Desjardins, mm -hmm. um, psychological, sociological research. She actually studied women leaders and found she had two models. One was a justice rights model of governing, ruling. The other was a supporting, nurturing model. And what she found was that 75% of the males fell into the justice rights, but 25 were in the nurturing supporting. 60% of the women fell into the nurturing supporting but 40% mm -hmm. fell into the justice rights. So when you make the generalizations, you may have a male with much more a nurturing uh, way of dealing with people, and by the same token, you may have a female who has the justice rights model, and I think we've all at different times seen those uh, uh, models being acted out. So generalities prove true, but not always within oh, the individual. And I, th I, so I think we need to, uh, to so go back and see if the individual proves the generality or if the specific um, changes that. Air mm -hmm. Well, and I agree. I think that what has happened is that previous models uh, for men probably fell in that justice form and that's what they thought they had to do, including, I think, an ego that women, a lot of women haven't used or displayed. Uh, women have always been in a more nurturing role, and that's what we bring into the leadership role. But I don't think that it's so much that men and women are entirely different. Again, I think that's how we grew up, and men were the disciplinarian, women were the mm -hmm. nurturer. Uh, we, we made decisions differently. So as we come to these places where we work together, I think we're learning from each other uh, in, in how to lead. And I, I'm not sure that I could say that men and women lead differently because they're men and women, but because of the culture they were brought up in. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. good point. Mm -hmm. I want to talk about um, something I did last week. I think for our viewers to compare these is really good. I mentioned on the program last week that I had the opportunity at the Gonzaga University Law School to debate a national author who wrote a book called The End of Racism, and I was so much respectfully disagreeing with him. He said that all uh, minority groups in, in our society <coughs> should do away and disregard their culture and, and adopt the dominant culture, and then racism would end. And I uh, had a very interesting debate with him on that issue. And so I, I say that to come to a question, and I'll start with Sandy Bloom this time. In my response to him, and there was a, I've always remembered this so much, there was one of the, the law students, she was a sophomore, or second year law student, she's Native American, and he was trying to get her to do away with her culture. And my point to her was, don't you do that. When you go into that law firm and sit at that table, you bring your gender with you and you bring your Native American, and that'll be a much more enriched corporation of law. So, uh, long introduction, but would you speak to the idea that, and I'm thinking of the legislature, Sandy, and, and some of your work, I found that as women have increased their numbers in the legislature, one of the great results of that has been in some parts of the country is that we've dealt with legislation that was addressing children more. In my view, unfortunately, in Idaho, we have not been able to get the, the more strict licensing of daycare centers, but it does make a change in policy. So would you speak to why, how you see that in, in all three of you in, in your life and the more diversity that comes in that decision-making, how does it change decision-making? 
Well, number one, I really agree with you. I would hope no one would give up their culture uh, to, to be somewhat, something or someone. That would uh, be heartbreaking to me. Um, again, I think that uh, what you bring into that leadership role, uh, women are going to be aware of some problems more than men, and they're going to bring those issues to the table. Daycare is certainly one that, that we, we look at. It's most often the mother that is out searching the centers, um, picking a child up, delivering, or it was. And so we are aware of the of the conditions we want in that daycare, perhaps more than men, and bring it to the table. We've seen the same thing with women's health issues when it was a predominantly men legislature or um, mm -hmm. you know medical field. Women's medical issues were not at the top of the list. But as we get involved, speak out more, um, the society is realizing what women's issues are, mm -hmm. and we will bring them to the table. And, and, <coughs> and you have a voice from within. Oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think we have a partner. I'm going to go back to that all the time. I think we have a partner within, but they often just hadn't been exposed right. to the issues. Right. Mm -hmm. Hazel Bowman? Well, I would talk about my um, field of work for an example. Uh, in education, in elementary education, the workforce is predominantly women. And we would love to see more young men and middle-aged men and older men <laughs> enter that workforce because the whole idea of role models, because the, 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 um, the children are about 50-50, 50% 50 50 girls, 50% boys. So a healthy mix of, of teachers and administrators at the elementary level would mean more men infused into that system. Mm -hmm. Then as we move into the middle <coughs> schools and the high schools, we see the switch and more and more of the um, certified staff end up being men, and clearly more administrators are male. And again, the mix of the students they're serving is still about 50-50. So if we're looking for role models, if we're looking for young women in the upper grades to say, you know, oh, I, want, I think I could do this, or this looks like this is a career path for me, um, we need to get more women into those leadership roles at the upper levels so that um, we can provide that, uh, what we talked about, that tipping point again, that critical yeah, mass. Lean Thomas. Sameness is boring. We need to celebrate differences. Whether it, think of, uh, robins are wonderful, but if they were the only bird around, what would we have? Mm -hmm. uh, if we had only uh, white bars of soap in lavender bathrooms, where would we be? It would, you know, it gets boring after a while. So you, you celebrate the differences, and I think the best way you do it is with humor. And I'm remembering, uh, See, before Lewis Clark State College, I was at the University of Idaho, and I used to be at uh, meetings uh, where I was the only woman. And so in one regular meeting uh, of the deans, I used to uh, have a weekly tie contest. <laughs> and I would just say, you know, that's the best tie. I, uh, that's a great tie. I think that may be the winner of today's tie contest. And I said, well, you know, no, I think maybe, I'm sorry. His his is is, is really better. I and agree with that. I, I knew you would, <laughs> and we would joke. And you know, in all the time I did that, nobody ever said to me, "Who made you the judge of ties?" Yeah. But to just treat with right. humor uh, right. the uh, the differences and to to appreciate them and actually celebrate them, it makes life so much more interesting. Those are wonderful examples for supporting diversity. And I, I really like your word, celebrating. Celebrating, accepting diversity is much different than being tolerant of it. Yes. It's a great step forward. In, in tolerance, if you're not careful, one says, look how great I am, I tolerate your difference. <laughs> Whereas celebrating is different. Bob Bennett. I hate ties. <laughs> I'm only wearing this for you today. Oh, and I do so appreciate your wearing it for me. It goes with your shirt, too. You know what? I've, I've done that same kind of thing lots of times. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the fact that if there are more women at a setting, if there are more women in a field, things do change with respect that you're more comfortable and that there are more of you there, and I think some things get done a little differently. Recognizing that there are more women in leadership roles today than probably ever in the history of mankind or womankind, what do you think women are going to do in terms of uh, changing business education and politics? Will there be obvious changes as more and more women assume those roles? 
Dean, tell us what you want. I think the first obvious change is that uh, as you get more of a balance, you get closer to half and half, gender isn't foregrounded anymore. When you're one woman or one man in a group of the, all the it's other hard. gender, mm -hmm. uh, then gender is foregrounded and stays that way for the whole meeting. As you move into uh, a, a better blend, 40 percent, 50 percent, uh, then you can get to work as individuals. But then we come back to the various strengths we have and the fact that there are differences. There uh, are differences, and, of course. And uh, I, I w would guess that uh, we would see some general softening, a little more cooperation, a little more working together, a little more communication. Uh, as uh, as we see more women, and I think that will be just great fun. My president's council at Lewis Clark State College, I have 14 administrators on the council, and they're half men and half women, and so gender isn't the issue. No longer, right? And now we get a, a greater diversity of opinions and uh, viewpoints and, and comments, and uh, I think it's I think they're just 14 wonderful people, and I'm very lucky. That's great. Hazel. Before you go, Hazel, I want to interrupt and, and comment on your, your thoughts before in terms of bringing more men into, uh, or women into the upper uh, grades. I just did a, a reading of something where they say in elementary school with all those women who are teaching, the students in America are do pretty well comparatively speaking with respect in terms of comparing with other nations. Unfortunately, when they move into the secondary field, mm -hmm. There's a direct drop. Mm -hmm. There might be, you want to be a little careful bringing all those, uh, <laughs> or, or maybe it would be good <laughs> to bring those women up. Anyway, let's, let's go back. I think there might be other variables in there. There probably but just, are, just but, few, I couldn't, but I couldn't <laughs> resist it. Um, I believe that as a group becomes more diverse, whether it's in gender or race or culture, that the, the group itself becomes more sensitive and more mm. tuned in. I think when you are, when there is, um, this homogeneity that really there is there's um, tunnel vision a little bit there isn't a need to think about other people and their viewpoints because we're all the same and I remember last week um, Dr. Bell talking about a group of uh, community college presidents that were all, not only were they all male they were all white mm -hmm. and and similarly I think if you had a group of all women that were all white you might get this this um, uh, sort of group think going that wouldn't be as healthy as when a, a variety of people are sitting at the table bringing to the problem that has to be solved or the the project their their own backgrounds their own experiences that rich tapestry that we're weaving mm -hmm. together and I noticed that in my own experience that um, when I first started in this field I would walk into a, a meeting of superintendents of the state there's 114 districts and there might be two or three women in the room and and definitely the the atmosphere was very male mm -hmm. <laughs> there was a lot of talk about male interests hunting and fishing and mm -hmm. and sports and and not that women don't like those things too but now there's much more sensitivity on both parts to have the initial social time be more um, gender neutral or or topics that our wide variety of interests. So I hope that if women are ever in the majority, we carry those lessons mm -hmm. to, uh, to our, our meetings and our groups and, and not become too um, group thinking. <laughs> yeah, well, the diversity, I really agree with that. In the city, we are, uh, you know, we have quite a few uh, of both gender, obviously. Mm -hmm. And in fact, at one time, we had a female uh, mayor, council president, uh, chief of police, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. a city administrator. And so we certainly, uh, it, we certainly have been allowed to have a lot of good uh, positions in the city. But the diversity is even more important to me, like you say, to bring. We operate in the city once a week. We have a meeting uh, that's all the department heads. And when they meet, they, and there are 17 of them, they act as one. And it's amazing to me when you bring a fire chief together with a police chief, together with someone who runs the wastewater treatment plant or the library or all the different departments we're working with, how the, how the problem might be more in uh, fire related or, and the solution might come from two people that you would least uh, think it would come from when they're all thinking together. Mm -hmm. So it's the diversity that we bring to the table of cultures and of, of of uh, 
ethnic backgrounds, all kinds of things that make the difference, I believe. I do want to put in a footnote here. One of your male employees was talking to me, and this is good, Sandy. <laughs> and he was so complimentary of you, and I think this is a characteristic, and you, both of you have spoken to this too. He, he, he's loved work, working for your city, and he said, the mayor is so open. She knows what's going on in every department. She doesn't isolate herself, and we all feel that we're important. I think that's part of the nurturing process, and he was just really, really complimenting you. And I heard you talk about your council, 14 men and 14 women. So we're almost out of time, but maybe 30 seconds to each one, even I'll start over here again. Um, why did you go into the, into the, in your case, the, you're a businesswoman, but you, why did you get into politics? First of all, I don't consider myself a politician. I'm a nonpartisan elected person, and, but I went into it because I, I, love, I love working with the community and with people. My family taught me that if you live in a community that's been rich for you, you have an obligation to give back to it. And, uh, and I took that very seriously. And I have uh, five children and 12 grandchildren and one grandchild here. I wish to make a difference for them and a lot of other people. Very good. Uh, you're doing that. And uh, President Thomas, how did you get into education? I am in education because I believe absolutely passionately that education changes people's lives. And I am in the business of helping people change their lives, bringing them together with that education. They'll never be the same. And you see that every day in, uh, in every examples. Every day, every day. Keeps your energy high. Absolutely. Yes, and Hazel Bowman? Well, the same reason. I, there's nothing more heartwarming than seeing a child's eyes light up when they learn something. But I also believe that education is the cornerstone of democracy. And, and I can't believe of a, I can't think of or know of a better system of governance and democracy. And without education, we wouldn't be there. Um, as a political scientist, I'm delighted to hear you say that. It takes a literate population to have a democracy. Literacy is very important. Well, to all three of you, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure having you here this week, as it was our guest last week. And ladies and gentlemen, we've immensely enjoyed bringing you these wonderful dialogues on the topic celebrating successful women in government and education. And these three guests are certainly great examples of that. Uh, and we do a lot of part two programs. And this ends this two-part series on uh, this topic. But next week, we will move to yet another issue, and we always invite from you uh, suggestions and ideas of what we might do that is of interest to you. And please be with us again next week at the same time, and we'll discuss another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. Music